Welcome to Anton Math, and in this section, we're going to be starting Unit 5 of Part 5 of our Precalculus series. We're going to be talking about inverse trig functions and going over what their graphs look like. Now, before we get started, I wanted to generally talk a little bit about what an inverse function is. Now, if we have some function f, oh, if we have some function f of x equals y, the inverse of that function, denoted f with a little negative 1 power, means f inverse of y equals x. This is what an inverse function is. An inverse function literally kind of undoes what the function, the original function does. So if you have if you're plugging in x and getting y, then you can find out what you plugged in to get y by plugging in that y to the inverse function. Now for this to work, it needs to be 1 to 1. Must be 1 to 1. And what I mean is, is that for every x, there has to be exactly one y that have this relationship through the function. And for every y, there needs to be exactly one x that have this relationship. Let me give you uh, an example of a function that's not one-to-one, -one, and that is x squared. So x squared is not one-to-one, -one, and what I mean by that is there are two different values of x to give any value of x squared. Right? If I look at x equals negative one and x equals positive one, these are both, both give an x squared value of one. Right? So if I have um, f inverse of this function, how would I know uh, what I'm plugging in? If, if I looked at f inverse of 1, does this equal 1 or negative 1? Right? It has multiple values that are possible because of what my function is. Right? Now it turns out here this doesn't have an exact inverse. It has two inverses. One is positive square root of x. Or sorry, yeah, one is positive square root of x and the other one is negative square root of x. Okay? So for us to talk about one distinct inverse function, we have to have a one-to-one -one function. Now this causes a little bit of trouble, doesn't it, with our trig functions? Right? And let me let me remind you why. Let's just take a look at uh, we're gonna be talking about inverse sine in this video. So let's take a look at the sine function. I'm not going to draw it too specifically, but we know that the sine function you know, looks something like this, doesn't it? And we have what's called the horizontal line test, and it's kind of what I just did uh, in that last example of x squared. But if you draw a horizontal line and you hit multiple points on the graph, then that function is not one to one, right? Let's say this is y equals one half. So if I had some inverse function for sine and I plugged in one half, well then I would get infinitely many possible values for the output of that inverse function. Now we have something that we do to take care of this. Uh, when we're talking about inverse trig functions, what we do is we reduce the domain of the function. So we don't have an inverse function for all of sine, the way that I've drawn it here. right? When we talk about the inverse of the sine function, we use a restricted domain, and it looks something like this. It's only from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So now you see, with this just little strip of the sine function, I can make an inverse function restricted to this part of sine, and we call that the inverse sine function. Okay, now that's just a little bit about um, you know some of the background about why we have some of the restrictions I'm going to go over. But now I'm just going to go over the inverse sine function in detail, and then I'll have two more videos after this: one for each of the inverse of cosine and the inverse of tangent. Now to make things a little bit easier, I've uh, prepared a little bit of a sheet for us to work on. All right. Now first we're going to be looking at sine in this video, and I'm going to keep this up to look at all the other functions. But first we're looking at the restricted sine x. Now we're going to be comparing that to its inverse function. Now the inverse function, not to sine of x, but to the restricted sine of x, is denoted 
sine inverse with its little negative one of x. This doesn't mean sine to the negative one power. This means sine inverse of x. Or we sometimes write arc sine of x. And both of these are, are interchangeable. They're both, but they're both great. Now, I just drew the graph for the restricted sine of x, right? We, we don't use the entire sine. We use a little portion of it, right? We go from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. And we know that sine goes up to 1 at pi over 2, and it goes down to negative 1 at negative pi over 2. So you see here, if I draw horizontal lines through here, I don't pass through any point twice. So this is a perfectly invertible function in that every output, in other words, every value of y, has exactly one value of x that's going to become the output of my inverse function. Now I'm going to draw the graph of this inverse function. You can think of it, it's, it's basically the sine function, but you're changing the respect of which variables. And I'll, I'll show that down here with the definition. Uh, but it looks a little bit something like this. Um, Okay, and this is from x going from negative 1 to positive 1, and y going up to positive pi over 2 and down to negative pi over 2. So we can see that the domain of my first function, this restricted sign, we've restricted the domain. Now usually sign is valid for all real numbers, but this restricted sign is only valid for pi over 2, negative pi over 2, sorry, to positive pi over 2. Now notice I'm using these closed brackets. That means that we include negative and positive pi over 2. They are a part of this domain. And the range is from negative 1 to positive 1 included. Now I'm going to go ahead and define this first. We define if I have that um, sine of x equals y. And this is the restricted sign, okay? Not not every value sign, not for every x is this true. But this little symbol here means there's an implication in both directions. But that's the same as saying sine inverse of y equals x, right? Just like in the introduction to this video when I talked about what an inverse function does, that's exactly what this sine inverse does, right? We're just unwinding or undoing what we've done. If you plug an x into sine and you get a y, you can plug that same y into sine inverse and you'll get your original x back, assuming, of course, that this was in your restricted domain. Okay. Now, because of this definition, it's pretty easy to figure out the domain and range of here. You could also use the graph, but for inverse functions, the domain of one function is always going to be the range of the other function, right? I have my x here in my domain of sine, and my x here is my range of sine inverse. So my domain of sine inverse is my range of sine. In other words, negative 1 to 1. Now, for anything outside of this domain, um, sine inverse is undefined. Okay, So it, it's not like sine, sine is defined everywhere. It's more like restricted sine, where it's only defined on a, on a short interval. And the range of sine inverse, of course, is going to be the domain of my restricted sine. So negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Everything's included here. And when we get to tangent, there will be some exceptions. We won't be including everything. Right? Now we also have what's called the cancellation laws. And we have these for all of our inverse functions. Now what these are are, if I have, um, <clears throat> if I have sine of sine inverse of x. This is equal to x, but only for certain values of x. Now you can probably figure out what those values of x are, right? Those are going to be the values of x for which sine inverse is itself defined. So any value of x that's in the domain of sine inverse, right? So for x between negative 1 and positive 1. Now sine inverse of sine of x is going to be equal to x for, and this is going to be for all values x that are in the range of sine inverse, right? I can't possibly get an x over here that's not in the range of sine inverse. Does that make, I hope that makes sense to you. Um, so my range of sine inverse, that's negative pi over 2 
x needs to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Now there are there's a difference between these cancellation laws. In this first one, if x is outside of the interval negative 1 to 1, we're not going to have a situation where it equals something else. This is not going to be defined because sine inverse is not defined for any x outside of negative 1 to 1. Now this bottom one, however, if x is outside of negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, this is still defined. This has a solution. It's just not going to be x. And I'll give you an example of that here in a second. That'll be our last example. So before we move on to the next video on the cosine, I'm not going to make an example videos for this section. Rather, I'm just going to do some examples for each of these functions as we derive them. So I have some examples here for inverse sine. And in the next video, we'll do um, inverse cosine and just have examples there for that. So examples. Let's say I have sine inverse of one half. All right, we don't know what that what that is. Now sine inverse of one half, what that means by my definition here is that sine inverse of one half equals x, where sine of x equals one half. Now the way that we know which x to choose is that x needs to be within this domain. Okay? So we know that sine of x equals one half when x equals pi over six. Now I need to make sure pi over six is in this domain, and it is. So this is going to be pi over six. Now this is a unique answer. Whereas with sine, you know, we go around that unit circle and go all those increments of two pi and get non-unique um, arguments for one output. Because of the way we've restricted the domain, there's always going to be one unique solution to these sine inverse problems. Okay, let's do another one. Let's say I have sine inverse of negative one half, for example. Right. So I'm looking for uh, what value of x I get sine of x equals negative one half. That's inside of this domain. Right. And that's going to be negative pi over six. Right. Same reference number. So I'm going negative. I need to be below that x-axis in my unit circle. All right. What about sine of three halves? Give you a second to think about this one. Oh, sorry, not sine of three halves, sine inverse of three halves. All right, now sine of inverse of three halves, if you get something like this, your solution would be d and e does not exist or is not defined. Right? We've only defined our sine inverse function to be within this domain, negative one to one. Any number that's outside of this interval, we don't have a definition for what that function is. It's just not defined for that. And three halves is bigger than one, so I know that this does not exist. All right, now let's look at some uh, cancellation law problems. Let's say I have sine inverse of sine of pi over three. Right. The first thing I want to know is, does this follow my cancellation laws? And we look over here to the left, I'm looking at this bottom one, right, sine inverse of sine. This is, uh, I can think of it as canceling this sine with this sine inverse, as long as x is in my restricted domain. And here we see pi over 3 is less than pi over 2, so this is in my restricted domain, so we're okay. We can just, we can kind of think of it as canceling these out. That's why it's called the cancellation laws, right? So it's just going to be pi over 3. Now conversely to that, what if I have sine inverse? of sine of 2 pi over 3. Right? Now my cancellation laws don't apply here. Right? 2 pi over 3 is bigger than pi over 2, so this is outside of this interval. So what I need to do to solve this problem, remember this is the second case, I said we can still solve this, it's just not going to be x. We cannot cancel the two functions per se. What I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate sine of 2 pi over 3. So I have sine inverse now, sine of 2 pi over 3, we know, is the square root of 3 over 2. And now, the square root of 3 over 2, that's inside of my domain for sine inverse, right? So this has a solution. But that solution is whatever this x value is in my restricted domain. And I know that sine equals root 3 over 2 at pi over 3, doesn't it? So sine inverse of sine of 2 pi over 3, sine inverse of sine of pi over 3 are the same thing. They're both pi over 3. And the reason is, is that both sine of pi over 3 
and sine of 2 pi over 3 actually equal the square root of 3 over 2. And that's the way we need to think about it when we're applying this sine inverse. All right, sorry this, was a little, this one was a little long. Uh, the next couple of videos will be shorter. We're just going to go over this same structure, uh, the domain and range restrictions and definitions of inverse cosine and inverse tangent. We'll see you there.